my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Elke Arslan, and she is from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees in physics from the University of uh, Illinois in Chicago, and then her PhD at the University of UC Davis. She then moved to the UK and was awarded a postdoc at the University of Cambridge. She has received numbers of awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award. Um, she will be talking today about 3D characterization of fischer tropsch catalysts before and after reduction. Please help me welcome Dr. Aslan. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, well, I would like to start today by congratulating Bert. Um, I don't have the 30 years of experience that many of the other speakers have had in working with him, but I do have about three or four years of experience. And when we first started working together, I was a little worried that he may not be as uh, quick to respond to emails as I would hope. And it turns out that he's actually much quicker <laughs> and much more, he has the efficiency of about 10 assistant professors combined in one. Not only does he respond to my emails immediately, but he also can produce uh, experimental data the same day. So I'm still trying to figure out how he does that. So I want to say thank you, Bert, for your contributions to the field, and thank you for your kindness and being a wonderful collaborator, and thank you to Gary Yagushi for organizing a wonderful symposium. So what I'll be telling you about today is sort of the culmination of the work that we've been, we've been doing over the past three years or so, and this is to try to understand what's happening to the fischer tropsch catalysts, their 3D morphology, both before and after reduction. So I'll give you a brief introduction on the methods because otherwise you maybe no, may not know what I'm talking about the entire time. And then I'll uh, show you some work that we did actually back in 2005 and finally published in 2008 on um, actually with uh, the Tron type group. And then I'll tell you about how we've been able to reduce the catalyst and quantify them in 3D as well. So I've been really pleased to see that there's been an increasing amount of TEM images in the talks and the catalysis symposia. Um, but I would also like to point out that what TEM is doing is taking projection images. We're taking two-dimensional images of three-dimensional objects and catalysts are extremely complex. And we really need to be able to uh, characterize these in 3D if we want to understand their true morphology. So we are using a technique called scanning transmission electron microscopy, STEM, which I, I haven't seen too much of um, in, well, it's growing. But we've been doing this for, actually my PhD was on this, and um, then when I went to do my postdoc, I learned from the pioneer of STEM tomography, and we've been doing that for about 10 years. So there's a lot of stuff I can tell you about this in terms of techniques, which I'm sure you're not that interested in, so I'll just shorten it to tell you a few brief things. Um, we can use the aberration correctors to achieve now atomic resolution, so single atom resolution. And the way that the method works is instead of parallel illumination, like you have in a TEM, you focus the probe down to the smallest point possible. And the, uh, if your probe is smaller than the interatomic spacing of the lattice, then that's the, the probe determines your resolution. And then the probe is scanned. It's always scanning, it's always moving. So we're, this is actually a much better method for reducing the current and the damage that goes into your sample because you can control the current and make it much smaller so you can go down to picoamps and you're also scanning it. So you don't have this constant uh, berating of electrons on your sample. The electrons are uh, scattered to high angles and detected on this annular dark field detector and this is Rutherford-like scattering. So it's really nice for catalysts again because with the heavier elements, they'll appear brighter, scatters to high angles, and there's a nice contrast with the um, lower element like alumina, those kinds of supports, silica, carbon that we're seeing. So what we want to do when we go to three-dimensional imaging, the two-dimensional resolution is not as important. What we need to do is take as many images as possible and span the tilt range as high as possible. This is not usually doable when you have um, catalysts because there are these new holders now where you can make a needle-shaped specimen and rotate that 180 degrees.
inside your microscope, but it's hard to make a catalyst, a powder, into that. So what we normally do is still take our three millimeter grids and we put our samples on there, and this is a tomography folder. It's thinner, it's like four millimeters uh, across. But as you can see, when you tilt it to 90 degrees, your, your beam is going to be blocked by the folder. Or actually, before that, your uh, sample will be blocked. Your, the grid bars in your sample will block you from getting to as high a tilt range as you would like. So what happens is, since you can't get up to minus 90 degrees, you have this artifact in here called the missing lens because there's all that information in 4 space that you just can't get to, you can't sample it. So it, it uh, manifests itself as an artifact, an elongation artifact in your reconstructions. Um, so here are a couple, I will say a way that we are trying to overcome this. And the way that we normally do the reconstructions is something called weighted back projection or an iterative back projection. So back projection is used really frequently uh, by everybody, but uh, primarily with the biologists in the field. Um, iterative back projection is something that my postdoc advisor has kind of brought back biologists used to use this many years ago and they don't so much anymore. But there are these fan artifacts. So here's, this is the iterative reconstruction of the system of weighted back projection. You can't see it very well here, but this is one of those needle-shaped specimens I was talking about. And if I rotate this 90 degrees, you're looking down, now you can really see all those fan artifacts coming from the reconstruction. And these are just not present in this, in the CERT reconstruction because compares to original images. And if it's not in the original image, it's not going to be in the reconstruction. However, as you can see from this slide, if you take a simulation image, and this is only 13 projections plus minus 60 degrees, and we do a surf reconstruction, you can see that it's still somewhat blurry. If you want to quantify the data, then you have to crush fold it. You have to try to take apart the catalyst from the support and all the different materials that you have. And if you do that, it's um, you're just doing it by eye, so it's not the greatest way of doing, doing the reconstruction of the application. But you can get something that's fairly close. Now this new algorithm that we've been um, working on with Yves Battenberg, who wrote the code, is called discrete topography, discrete algebraic reconstruction technique. And even for a very small number of projections, you can get back something that's fairly close to your original images. And this is important for analysis because we, do, we want to minimize the electron dose going into our samples. Okay, so I'm going to start with this work that we did back, um, the experiments we must have done back in 2005 when I was at Cambridge. Uh, Paul Midgley is the person I'm talking about who pioneered the method. And this is with uh, John Mosley, who came over to do the experiments with me, and Edward, and um, Anderson, we're just trying to figure out why he's not on the paper, <laughs> because he was also involved in but um, I was just a mere postdoc at the time, so I don't, I, I don't know if we can't remember. So we looked at two systems. One of them was this cobalt on gamma aluminum. And if you look at this image here, um, it's, a, it's also a massiveness method. So you can say, well, it could be the cobalt because it appears brighter, but it could also be the thick region of the aluminum. It's really difficult.
in here. Other than maybe stock in there. That isn't filled. So when we multiply this, we can see that within our uh, plus minus five percent, the kettles in the court are actually housing porosity. So they formed an interlocking structure. And what we think is that um, uh, the cobalt was introduced in there and just filled the entire. So then we went to um, this another system I actually don't know all the details about because I wasn't told them, but what I do know is that they, this is alpha and there is it was coarsened with nickel, so there's a nickel aluminum structure and cobalt oxide. So this is even more and it's more difficult to tell just from the image where the cobalt is or what. This movie, you can see that it looks like there's a big chunk here and a big chunk here that is really not porous at all. There are some regions down here that look quite porous, and there are some brighter regions around here. And as I showed you, the cobalt only likes to attach to the nickel aluminum, and then the nickel aluminum attaches to the alpha aluminum. The alpha aluminum are these two big pieces that are not porous. But the nickel aluminate, the porous aluminate, sort of generates the aluminum pieces. As you'll see here. So here's the nice porous nickel aluminate that's been attached to these non porous aluminum chunks. And when we look at the morphology of the cobalt oxide here, you can see that it's very much that these little nano cases surround. Now when we cut out one of those little structures, we look at it uh, more. We see that the support in it is actually quite porous. It has percent But interestingly, it likes to hang out the rather than fill voids in the first first show you. So we took our
that's what you've mm -hmm. been doing also. And it takes quite a while to do the 3D um, mapping because mm -hmm. you have to go slide by slide by slide, right? Yes. And so when when you do 2D TM, which is you know like only can use this one projection, mm -hmm. but if you have a highly concentrated beam, then you can actually see that the electron mm -hmm. interacts with the surface of the of the cobalt particle, mm -hmm. and you can see that there is some type of movement or some. Um, it's, it's almost like a dynamic system, and you can see yes. how the electron beam itself reduces the sample. Yes. And you can see it moving to the outside. So the extreme long timing that's required to go and do all of these separate sections, do you think there's some, some uh, you know, reduction with that? There is definitely, um, we have seen reduction. So we've also done some in-situ experiments where we put in the gas and we heat it up and then the electron beam continues the reduction process, um, but that's in TEM. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we're looking at really, we're using low beam Why currents. Well, it's scanning. Okay. It's a focus probe, but it's scanning, and the current is much lower than in TEM. Okay. And we didn't see, we even tried doing um, experiments where we just heated it, and or just put in a gas, and of course, you know, you don't get, you don't get any change to the morphology of the structure unless you have both the gas and the temperature. Yeah, and we did not see any change uh, from image to image in the in the movement. These are pretty big um, cobalt particles, but when we look at uh, small atoms or clusters of you know four atoms or something, then we definitely do see movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good question. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Would you describe these as like eggshell type? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a thin shell. Yeah. I call them nano pages that we can <laughs> call them like egg eggshells. That's good. Yeah. So the core diameter that you have is smaller than the size of the cobalt crystallites that form on reduction. So the question is, is it kind of like a chicken versus an egg. If you started with larger core diameter, do you support? Are you still going to see that migration? And I think the answer is probably no. But it's hard to make cobalt particles less than eight nanometers unless you do something special. So they kind of have to come out. So they, they just don't form in there. I don't know, it's, it's really complex, isn't it? And I was looking at your images when you presented the other day, and our cobalt doesn't look anything like yours, but yeah, it's- we don't have to put diameters that small. Right, well of course it's gonna be dependent on your load, your metal loading, and it's gonna be dependent on the support very much. Um, and I don't think that your support is Illumina, <laughs> based on the images I've seen, even though you can't tell me what it is. So, um, yeah, I don't know. If we would it's, it's always a question with these cabinets. If you have a high surface area, you normally you think that's good, but you have small pore diameters. You yes. can't get the cobalt won't stay in there. That's true. So you can't really use the whole support. Yeah. You can so get the impregnated in, but not when the metal comes. Not when the metal comes. Yeah, so it's ideal that it's moving off to the surface. I saw some, yeah, yeah. which one? Uh, the other one. Uh, I'm just wondering, when you publish your results, you publish one or two pictures or publish a whole movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, we publish, well, we publish the, the pictures, the, uh, just the images, but no, um, we also upload the movies. Oh, so okay. the movies are available um, for our joint paper. The first one, it's in JAX. So if you go on the JAX website, you'll, you can download the movies. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Which is a cha which has become a challenge with um, 3D methods and publishing. Especially some journals still, you know, want to publish black and white, which is really frustrating. Any other questions for Dr. Arslan? If not, please help me thank her for this nice presentation. Thank you.